All right. So welcome to this talk about optimizing uh, SPEC 2017. So I have a, few, a short few slides to show why we're going after SPEC and also a couple, a couple of the things that we're looking at and hopefully open up the discussion to what you guys are, are looking at as well. So what's SPEC 2017? It's essentially the industry standard benchmark for Linux benchmarking. So it consists of two parts. It has an integer and a floating point benchmark in benchmarks. Um, you can also you could run it with one copy, so it'll test just your, uh, your single core performance, or you can run it n times, which where n is your number of cores. So then the intention is that that, that tests the entire system. So it's just, it's just your memory bandwidth and your caches, etc. So why are, why are we looking at this? Because like I said, it's an industry standard, and GCC is about 17% behind overall compared to the leading proprietary compilers. And so it means that ARM and pairs of our partners really care about closing this gap as much as possible. And so that means that as ARM, we'll be aggressively going after spec for the next few GC releases. So there are various categories of improvements that we're going after. Some of them are quite general. Like for instance, we need to handle permutes better in GCC because not all targets have a plethora of instructions to handle complex, complicated permutes. So we should, the compiler just needs to generate better code for this. There's a lot of low-hanging on factorization um, work where GCC just doesn't factorize code that it can. And most of these will benefit all targets. And on top of this, we have a lot of improvement that's improvements that we could do on the relating to LTO and IPA, et cetera. So as an example of one of the things that we're going after, so in this case, it's a very simple loop doing an addition, a reduction essentially, but because of the sign change in the reduction, GC doesn't vectorize this at all. And so, but, but when you're vectorizing, you don't really care about the overflow, so you can just ignore this, the, the sign overflow and vectorize it. We have a patch upstream for this, it's going to the review process. This already gives about 6% increase on spec end. So a tiny, a tiny change, large, large performance increase. You also have other loops, such as this one, which GSC can factorize. It's a simple loop, but the problem here is because width and height are basically <laughs> unbounded, you factorize using your maximum vector width, which will end up being, for air 64 for instance, 16 bytes. Now, if you do the analysis of the function, you'll realize that the function is called a lot of, a lot of times with both, both 16 and a lot of times with eight sizes. So when you call it with 16, you get your, your vectorized version of the code. When you call it with eight, it falls back to the scalar version. So you leave a lot of performance on, on the table. So the solution we, um, we have upstream right now is that you essentially generate two versions of the loop, one with your maximum vectorization size and one, and one with one a smaller step. And if you do this, you, this gives about 16% overall on, on XL264. To, on XL to and the code size increase isn't that much. We've measured it by turning, turning it on, on by default and everything seems to be okay. Um, we also have a problem with GCC that we don't really reroll loops. So if you look at this very simple loop, GCC A can't factorize this on a lot of targets since when it tries to, it thinks it needs a very complicated permute here. But if you look at it, it's just doing the same operation over and over again. So someone hand, hand unroll the loop. If you re-roll the loop, you get a, a lot better scalar code, a lot better factorization code, and the cost for, factor, for factorization goes down dramatically. So GC starts making a lot better decisions. So one of the things we really want is to take a look at implementing a general re-roller. Re and one of the things that we, want, what we also want to look at is, for instance, with LTO enabled, you have such loops with have a secondary control flow inside the loop. The break there is problematic because you can't factorize it because you don't know how much, if, if you're allowed to read ahead. But essentially, there are uses of this function in which, is, in which it's past a static array, so you know the size of it. And if you know the size of it, and if you know you're never writing to such array, you can just ignore the break and factorize. And so we're hoping that with LTO and some IPA, we can get this enough information to be able to, to do this. Now, there's also the 
larger category of optimizations that are a bit more controversial, which we call the hero optimizations. So these will help you when you want to improve the end copies. So for instance, uh, structure peeling, which I believe was once already in GCC, we want to essentially bring it back. What it means that if you have such a structure, and anytime you, if you put this structure in an array, if in the loop body you're accessing a single element of the array, it's going to have a quite bad cache behavior since the, the, the entries are not sequential. So if instead you, you reorganize your array, storing each, um, each element in the structure next to each other, you, you then basically access them sequentially. And from this, you can, follow, you can follow up with a lot of different optimizations, such as automatic pointer compressions, et cetera. And so, I'll give you the mic. Okay. But uh, I would imagine one of the fundamental problems is is ISO C and ISO C++ have strict ordering requirements in them that the address of structure elements must be must always be increasing. So it, I tend to view that while this helps quite a lot and this can help quite a lot in real programs, it is violating the ISO C ISO C++ standards. I mean, this is clearly just applying the as-if rule. If the program can't tell. Yeah. I believe uh, some of the previous sort of research in this area says that you need pretty sophisticated like escape analysis or some of the sorts that that detects all the ways the, which the, in which this can break and then bails out. So basically, what I really want to get out of this buff is to understand who else in the community is interested in the spec 2017 and get an idea of what other performance issues that all of you have encountered and also what's the best way to collaborate. Like I said, we're aggressively going after spec 2017, but we want to get as much as possible in a generic form and basically how we can avoid creating useless work for, for maintainers. So one of the big problems with spec is that it's proprietary, which makes it hard for people without access to it to um, solve bugs filed about it without actu actual access to the sources. So how, how is the rest of the community without access supposed to, supposed to help with these cases? So if you look at the, all these bugs that I've mentioned, all our obscene PRs, in which we've minimized the case, reduced it down to a very single thing that you don't need spec to run. If you can fix that, that test case, the, the spec one will, will work. So essentially, the community is able to help by fixing these, very, these reduced cases. You might not be able to benchmark the final results, but we're quite happy to do that. So um, <clears throat> speaking for the power community, uh, we're very, very interested in this as well. And in fact, we've um, hired a new team over the last year that's going to be focusing almost entirely on uh, SPEC 2017. Not entirely, but you know, those kind, that's one of the, th the areas that we also think is uh, really ripe for improvement. Um, as far as other performance issues that we've encountered, I think most of these things are already upstream in terms of bug reports. Um, there's, a, there's a complicated bit of um, specialization and cloning and modulo detection and so forth that can be done for exchange yep. um, to, uh, to deal with the hot loop for the Stoku solving. Um, and so I think there's a bug that's open on that and we're, we're making incremental progress on that uh, thanks to uh, Shong Hu here. Uh, in the room, um, so that's one. I'm sorry. TM4 is another one that we just discovered, and what that is is it really needs a good permute. Um, it has a, it loads up four um, floating point single precision floating point values. In one structure, they are in a different order than another. 
So if they were in the same so order in both structures, you could just use vectorized um, adds and subtracts and so forth. But instead, what it does is it loads it up as a vector, then it splits it into four scalar operations, does all the scalar operations, and then reconverts it back to a vector. And so we also know that um, the struct reorg is a is a definite uh, benefit on a couple of different benchmarks. Uh, I couldn't cite them for you at the moment, but I think you're already aware of those. And uh, we're also quite interested in, in what you've talked about in terms of uh, revi reviving struct reorg in an LTO context. I think that that's absolutely spot on, and we'd be you know, happy to, to help in terms of convincing the community and, and uh, contributing in any way we can on that as well. So uh, we're, uh, we're right behind you on this. We don't have a whole lot of uh, people. We don't have a whole lot of um, expertise yet. We're building that up. But we're, we're, uh, we're wanting to be there with you on this one. So thank you. Well, we, not yeah, we noticed a particular issue, but <coughs> I'm not sure if you see that or not. Uh, we observed the behavior of, say, a chain, a commit, is different from a one copy run versus multiple copy run. Say, a one copy mm -hmm. run, say, may improve benchmark, say, 2%. And when we run with multiple copy, we saw like 4% slowdown. Have you seen something similar? It, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, we see both ways. Yeah. yeah. Okay, any insight on that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know yet. Part, part of that might be your turbo mode. <laughs> oh. So, so um, just to uh, basically reinforce what others already said, uh, or the IBM guys said, so SUSE is always traditionally interested in the spec CPU performance. <clears throat> so we were working very hard on 2006 for many years. And since 2017 came out, we basically started doing something there as well, at least performance tracking com and comparing with different compilers. Where is <clears throat> so that's our work. Um, our model of work is basically seeing what other compilers are doing. And if, they are, if the gap is too large, then look at why. Uh, what we are not usually doing is taking one benchmark after another and looking where where the bottlenecks are and what could be done to improve that, because it's just easier to look at what other compilers are doing, <laughs> of course. Um, so yeah, and that's what we are doing with 2017 as well. Um, so count us in. Um, yeah. And I think how to best collab collaborate. I think in the past, um, the one reason that the collaboration didn't really take off or, or actually or sometimes produced double double the amount of work is that that uh, if somebody analyzed something, then that is not really published somewhere, consumable by other parties, but rather, you know, you get a patch and then after one year, basically, you, you, after analyzing something, you have enough manpower to write the patch for that and then you commit it and then it's wonderful and fine and and, and the graphs increase. And but, but during that year, others could have written the patch it, if just the information would have been uh, out and one thing, of course, is writing the bug reports as, as you did. But I think also just writing a text, whatever you found out in the analysis, just writing a wiki article or something like that, or um, why you think so. Basically, an analysis report, uh, and and that's what we we were doing internally, and never published them. But maybe that is or was wrong <laughs> in hindsight, right? So maybe that that would be something to collaborate. Of course, always with the danger that other compilers would use that analysis to improve their scores as well. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. And, and of course, you know, some of our managements have at times wanted us not to publish it in GCC because it would help x86 or whatever. But getting back to running spec and all that kind of stuff, there are several benchmarks that are memory bound and I find that they oftentimes vary with you run the exact same binary even if you try to do everything right by turning off stack randomization turning you know all this kind of stuff it the same binary can vary multiple to, you know by five ten percent one one or two times and um, we found by using huge uh, malloc pages helps sometimes to reduce the variability so the last time I ran spec 2017 was about six months ago 
and I was down to one benchmark that was less than one, that was more than one percent varying when I did the three runs. I tend to view personally if if it varies by more than one percent on the three runs, I'm it's too variable. I can't look at it in terms of code generation and all that kind of stuff. You know, obviously there are things in the past, you know, fast math versus um, just O3, OFAST, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, well, no, I didn't want to interrupt you, Mike. I just uh, <laughs> that, that that wasn't intended to cut you off. <laughs> I just had a different thought. It, it was I I was tr struggling to come up with the next thought. So. Okay, so uh, I want I wanted to get uh, clarification on your last bullet there, uh, Tamar. Um, how can we avoid creating useless work for the maintainers? What do you mean in terms of useless work here? So we've had a couple of occasions where we submit a patch and then we're, we're essentially told don't do it like that, do it somewhere else. So then we do go do it somewhere else and then we're told don't do it like that, do it like this. So we'd like to get into a situation where we don't spend time reiterating on the same patch over and over and over again. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's always a concern with just about anything in the middle end in my experience, uh, yeah. not just not just spec. Um, and I think the key is simply to communicate early and often on that one. Uh, don't wait until you've got a full patch before taking your idea out there and, and, and working. And work particularly with, you know, I mean, we all know Richie's a busy guy, but he's also very interested in this stuff. So CCing Richie on, on some general commentary on GCC patches, I think, is always a good start. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, one, one of the things we've noticed, and I'm sure other people have noticed too, is, is you know, somebody checks in a patch that improves x86, for example, by quite a lot, but it degrades power or degrades ARM. And so, you know, we have to be cognizant of the fact that we want to try and optimize for everybody, not just one special case. Yeah, agreed. Um, although usually it's the case that if something improves the generic vectorizer, let's say, uh, to make an example, um, it also often goes hand in hand in some backend, either tuning or, or even implementing new patterns. And, and that, of course, needs to be uh, done by the target maintainers, by the respective ones. So, but it needs to be communicated. That's, 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 that's true. Yeah, that's true. And, and sometimes that's not really done because then it just happens so that, that x86-64 is becoming faster and, and it is all there if you read all the GCC patches mails, but uh, of course that's unrealistic, right? So. Say it again. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Especially beforehand. <laughs> Right, exactly, and that's that's the thing with what I said about yeah, write something down in the wiki so that you know. They, I mean, there's only a very f small, finite amount of benchmarks in 2017, so there would be would be one article per benchmark and then generic observations and then target observations that, that could be just filled in by the interested parties. And yeah, for instance, yeah, and, and somebody used to do that for spec many many years ago. Yeah. Uh, I think it was actually the the old hardware vendors, um, but that that kind of you know characterization of a benchmark. Yeah, the characterization that, that, that was still with 2000s. Is yeah, yeah, it was a long time ago, but those characterizations I found invaluable yep. when I was looking at spec. So building that knowledge base of what, what these benchmarks do, where are the hot loose, what are the memory access patterns, what are the, the permutation patterns to get good vectorization, that data yeah. would be hugely beneficial. So finding a way to communicate across our you know, different organizations is, is a big piece of this problem. You do have to be cognizant of the spec rules, and oftentimes the compiler people are not the ones producing the numbers, you know, and, and they want to use the right machine, the right memory, and, you know, they, they have their job, you know, to do the right thing, but we can't necessarily publish numbers. We can publish, you know, this is five times faster, or two times slower, but you can't necessarily say, oh, the, the spec number for this particular benchmark is 120. 
23. Or as long as you follow the rules. Yeah, but but part of the rules is you you can't uh, disclose the source code, so it's difficult to point to individual loops and say, hey, look at this. This is where it should be because that's against the law. So we have to be very careful about how we share that kind of information. We had some. Okay. <laughs> we have somebody here. No. Okay. Well. Just, just standing back a bit. Um, I, it's wonderful hearing this conversation about a set of source code that I have never seen and am unlikely to ever see because I haven't paid them up. And well, I know, yeah, some of it. But the, but the one of the is there a bigger question? Because getting spec CPU, I understand for corp, a corporate level, it's important to get a good spec CPU results. But actually, at a more abstract level, it's about making better compilers. And one thing that I, I don't have good visibility of. Do we in GCC do anything in the same way that we run regression routinely to make sure we haven't broken anything? Do we run an actually non-functional performance regressions? Yeah. Because um, I, I, I don't know where to look for those. Because GCC open source of the dog. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. But possibly that ought to be part of, just as you've got make check, there ought to be part of make check that is actually trying to get performance, both execution speed, code size, and whatever. Yeah. Um, because we, we've, seen st we've seen in other projects where actually you've got wonderful new features and no one's noticed that performance has dropped off a cliff because you weren't measuring it. Well, there are multiple parts about it. So you can't do that with proper benchmarks because they tend too long for to run. If for to, they tend to run for too long because they need to be proper and therefore need to minimize variations and therefore need to have a meaningful runtime. Um, so you don't want to do that as part, for instance, of a GCC test suite run. That's already taking, taking long enough. But you do that regularly and publish the results. And that's what some people are doing. Yeah, uh, that's that's because we have enough not, not enough people to look at the numbers. If you, it's it's terrible uh, because there are very many numbers. Uh, but I just wanted to say um, one part to the first parts of what you said is that uh, spec actually, while it is not open, which is a sad thing, it does reflect a large part of software that is performance sensitive. Uh, so so it's not like made up artificial benchmarks, it's really things like weather forecasting or quantum chromodynamics or, or chemical. So it's really reflecting what people are actually using uh, in, the, in the real world. So, so improving performance for spec is actually the same as creating a better compiler. It might not help everything else, but it does create a better compiler for the whole world. But for example, you can get better performance for DeepsJank if you uh, bump up the cost of uh, jump a little bit, uh, at least for the generic x86-64. And uh, we looked at the test case and thought, well, that helps that particular data set because it's basically uh, searching for a maximum over an array. But it's probably not the good thing to do generally. So, you know, it's, it's not always the case, but you know, there are there is sometimes like a trade-off, you know, this improves spec, but might hurt everybody else, really. Uh, yeah, and you still have to have I made the mistake of giving up the mic, having asked the question. The, um, so, I, 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 I think if you, my earlier talk, there was green against all the specs. Spec I recognize as being a good set of benchmarks. I think that only makes it worse that it's not generally available. Um, so, I think that that's a separate issue. It's not the issue I'm trying to solve, but it is. I don't buy the. I buy the absolutely. You've got to run long enough to get good performance results. But it takes several hours to run a full GCC regression. I don't think performance tests actually take far more. <laughs> yeah, on how many cores? Yeah, yeah, well, but that's the same as GCC regression on a single core takes that long. I mean, I mean, look, none of us run on a single core. Um, I, I mean, I think there is an element of, you know, 
you know, you perhaps, you know, for something so important, so we might. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But presumably, these benchmarks, because they're big benchmarks, are running multi-threaded. Uh, no, they're not. Sorry. Um, in, spec, uh, yeah. in spec, you can either do rate or CPU. CPU is single threaded. Rate is intended to be across multiple threads and all that kind of stuff. So, um, <laughs> Tamar, on one of your early slides, you said something that I think I understood what you meant. You said GCC's performance was ninety percent worse than I think you said commercial compilers. Yes. You didn't name them, and I've already seen people make a deduct, rephrase that statement to in such a way that you could assume you actually meant LLVM there in that set. And I don't know whether you did, no. because if you did, you could have said LLVM, whereas you can't say the production compilers, that you, the commercial compilers that you benchmarked against, because that violates the license of those compilers, which is one of the problems with why GCC always gets beat up on benchmarks because it's the one that commercial compilers can benchmark okay, against yeah. and now LLVM. So I just want to be clear that that 90% is not including LLVM. That's correct. And do you know what the LLVM numbers are relative to GCC? That would... <laughs> right. Big, big, because... The, that num I can see that now being quoted that we're 19 percent worse than LLVM, which is LLVM not. Doesn't have Fortran, so the yeah, so LLVM doesn't really have a Fortran like a major Fortran front end. Uh, so they, you know, e even spec int numbers don't exist for 2017 for LLVM really. Uh, so no, uh, that it's not LLVM. But that said, so a lot of these test cases, LLVM doesn't factorize either. So we expect them to have at least the same, the same problem. So, so just anecdotally, I've run a bit of um, LVM, at least a part of spec that compiles with LVM um, on a, some ARC 6 4 hardware. And it was in the same ballpark that you see, but a bit consistently behind on the particular configuration of flags I was using. So not, not a, any definite proof or anything, but it so was not. If I can, I think that you know, comparing to LLVM especially, I feel look at OFAST uh, and, and native ISA, uh, Mark, uh, Mtune uh, equal to native, GCC is doing better overall. The one concern and big concern that we're having is, and I don't know if anybody's ever concerned about it, but in terms of coming up with a better compiler we might be, is our performance at O2. Because we don't vectorize, we are very conservative. We our our binaries are very small, but we are quite a bit slower. At OFAST, we we are noticeably faster. But for example, Linux distributions are generally built with O2, and people just you know tend to put O2 there, uh, especially for integer code. I mean, of course, when someone is crunching floating point numbers, then they are probably or at least hopefully a little bit more careful uh, and might have hopefully maybe uh, heard about OFAST and, and, and uh, fast math. Uh, if they don't, didn't, then there's not too much we can do about it, but at least for the integer bits. Uh, and, and of course, the big outlier there is the X264 benchmark, which is very, very dependent on vectorization, the whole performance, and we don't vectorize at O2. We do vectorize when we have profile feedback. So all of a sudden, the, you know, <laughs> with profile feedback at O2, our, our performance is great. Um, so, yeah, and, and in response to, to your statement, I mean, um, you know, regardless of what you think about Veronix, um, there have been, you know, head-to-head -head comparisons of GCC and LLVM on power recently, for example, that show that LLVM is generally significantly behind GCC on the variety of benchmarks that they test. Now, that's not spec. That's a bunch of different other stuff. Uh, my own experience is that, that LLVM is a bit behind GCC on power as well, but on spec as well, but uh, I don't have numbers to back that up. I have a question. Um, in the 
the uh, app unroll loops was is not default at any of the application level. Is any plan to enable app the unroll loops by default at all fast or something? Uh, have you made measurements showing that it improves anything? Yes. Well, we we did, and it didn't improve anything. It to it didn't improve anything enough to be worthwhile the code size increase. So unroll loops with 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 modern processors that actually have you know branch prediction. It, it's not it's not worthwhile. Especially really. with vectorizer and roll loop. Yeah, well, no. the ve vectorizer as soon as it vectorizes, it, it does implicit loop unrolling. Yeah. Uh, you don't need to explicitly unroll loops to be able to vectorize them. Okay, we will double check it. But and. Is Honda there? We, we, because because, uh, because we, 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 we did look at that. Okay, so I spent some time looking on it, and yes, I think we should enable more stuff. You know, I was speaking on uh, enabling the inline, uh, inline functions for Outdo. And okay, I will speak closer. And con concerning the vectorization, yeah, no, I have even posted some data to the mailing list. Uh, you know, it brings important uh, performance improvement. It's increasing cost too much, even with the conservative uh, tuning. So we need to fix the cost model, which is something I plan to do early stage one after I enable inline functions, and I'm still working on inline functions. So I would welcome help, but yeah, it's on my to-do list uh, to do this stage one, and I hope, uh, yeah, we will do something about it. Uh, we we noticed that the uh, app, the unroll loops also enable other optimization, which helps even though there's no loop at all. <laughs> While we open a bug. So, so I will. Um So I'll, I'll throw in some support for the discussion about F unroll loops. Um, it used to be much more dicey for us on power with F unroll loops. With some of the recent uh, changes that we've made to some of our addressing, uh, things are looking better, and I'm seeing it as a as a win for the most part. But I also see that it's very uh, it can be unstable as you make other changes uh, sometimes. You know, we've, we've seen, uh, I think Shung Hu was doing some experiments recently, or one of his colleagues, I don't remember who, but uh, they, you know, made a small change. I think it was Cohen, actually. They made a small change and um, uh, discovered that, you know, the expected benefit was not there and that unroll loops had somehow gotten in the way of it. So I think there are still enough problems with unroll loops hiding that, that it can be a bit of an issue. It's it's still not a 100% always great thing, but for the most part, it usually gives us a lot of benefits. So we, we tend to tell people to turn it on a lot if they're having performance problems. So I'm kind of in the same boat with you that we need to get unroll loops. I think there are a few fundamental problems with it that need fixing, and once we get to that point, maybe it should be part of at least 03, uh, if not, if not 02. So. And we do have a test case in which the vectorizer couldn't vectorize it because of a control flow inside the loop again, another break. But if you would unroll it, you would you would have gotten a bit more benefit out of it. But in this case, we just leave it alone. So, so one part of unroll loops is uh, one bad part is of course that it always unrolls by eight. <laughs> no matter what, that's the only thing it can do. It can unroll by by eight, and and then that's what it's doing. And if yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, which is which makes no sense. It is unrolling by four or two might sometimes be enough, and so on. So, we did some experiments regarding that, and then it turned out that yeah, unrolling by two is sort of bringing most of the performance that unrolled by eight is also bringing without some of the regressions, and um, that's with the crude existing RTL unroller. Of course, right. we could do something more interesting, possibly on the if we wrote an 
GIMP on roller. But at the time I looked at the numbers, I decided that it wouldn't. Basically, I wanted to look if, if writing an RTL unroller that is made, sorry, a GIMP on unroller that is more configurable and more sensible to the number of iterations and so on uh, would be worthwhile. And I decided that it's not uh, because unrolling didn't help much uh, as far as I could determine uh, on x86-64. That might be different on different architectures. Of yeah, I think I think it is very different on different architectures. That's that's one thing to think about. Uh, the other thing is we did. You know, we noticed the same phenomenon, and we we were trying to play with okay. Well, it's only going to do powers of two. Let's see what we can do if we don't just limit it to powers of two. And we found that there actually wasn't a whole lot of difference in there in between four and eight. The viability of going between four and eight, and that that actually looking at putting a patch together for non-power of two wasn't actually taking us anywhere. So we kind of dropped that at that point. But nonetheless, we still see the loop and rolling that we get out of it is for the most part still quite useful. And and again, because it enables other optimizations in the back end. There's also the case where we unroll the loops because the loop factorizer couldn't factorize it, but then the SLP should have been able to factorize it, but then it misses it for various reasons. So we need to improve there as well. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think in some cases we, we are looking for not, not general uh, loop unrolling, but target loop unrolling. Like, in the if conversion path, we have infrastructure to perform changes only on, on the loop we want to actually vectorize and have the scalar loop for backup. And we don't want to do the changes in that part because that just makes the code larger. In, in case we manage to vectorize it, then so, so kind of things like this. And another thing which, which happens quite often is that uh, Unrolling uh, helps just because the loop could be computed completely at compile time. So have something like const expert evaluation, which we have in the C++ front end, have something in the Gimple uh, middle end somewhere where we can just look at the loop, see if, if we can find out how many iterations it has and compute them all at compile time with, with some limit and, and see if all the side effects of the loop can be computed easily. Yeah, I, I mean, one other thing to think about and is is vectorized libraries, MVEC or whatever, and it really would be nice, you know, Power has its library, x86 has two different libraries, the AMD library and the Intel library, I'm sure ARM has at least one, and, but it would be nice to have, get MVEC further along so that we have a free, free solution that can do vectorized sine, vectorized cosine. There are two benchmarks in, in this floating point um, that are very highly dependent on, on the math library functions. And of course, in the int functions, we find memcopy and memset are the two key functions to optimize for. So if you have a, a bad memcopy in your library, it can affect your performance. And malloc is another, is another thing. Yeah, so. Well, yeah. <laughs> GCC is M, M set is is the primary thing, and the, the, um, two of the C plus plus things are malloc based yeah. and, and so forth. So w one of the things we have also looked at is the comparison between glibc and jmalloc, and jmalloc consistently beats out glibc no matter how much we tweak it. So it's probably something you also want to look at in the future. But by doing the vectorized sine and cosine, you then get into the question of sig cos and should we have a version of it with a better interface that doesn't involve pointers that some people have raised. So should we be proposing something for ISOC that give the turns as a complex number sign of IX or whatever? That question, because then you have a better interface in the library and you do vectorize the scalar versions of that and so forth. Uh, there are so many options and uh, parameters in GCC. Is there any infrastructure we can use machine learning technology to train them? I mean, such like a uh, different RTS cost and uh, different uh, parameters used by heuristic algorithms. We can just uh, use machine learning.
by the way, I just wanted to um, uh, get out some one thing, uh, namely thanking you, uh, arm guys, for the new uh, math routines in, in Gilipsy. Uh, that is wonderful. <laughs> it's something <laughs> that nagged me for a long time and long years, but never, we never, yeah, nobody ever get around fixing them. So thanks. <laughs> Usually, what 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 is it? Thirty-four percent at O pass. Thirty at O pass to eight. Well, that's Mark. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So yeah, the the biggest increase when comparing GLPC two dot twenty six versus two dot twenty eight, I believe it was. Yeah. My, my nine. <laughs> yeah, that that's probably just just misleading title. I believe it's basically repackaged to twenty and it might. 228 uh, just for the old distribution, so everything else stayed the same. And uh, WRF improved the most, over 30%. So all, everywhere across yeah. the board, so yeah, wonderful. <laughs> of course. Because it might be even faster than <laughs> The old implementation. Uh, yeah, yeah. That uh, the new new implementation is no longer uh, half ULP uh, precise anymore. Well, uh, we only had that for for double, but sometimes it was so slow that you might get just complete software emulation using using lib MPFR and get get faster results over what what we did. Yeah, so that was actually for 229, I got it in the fine print. And it was also with Martin's uh, work included uh, that actually now allow us uh, to call into the vector library from Fortran. Uh, which I'm, I'm not sure how much it mat matters, uh, how, how much of the improvement was to, due to the, this thing and due to the general improvement, most of it was due to the ARM work, but that might be important as well. Um, so if not... I hope you don't mind one more comment about uh, the unrolling. So uh, there is an effect that uh, the processors are getting wider. So for example, Intel is doing core instructions per cycle for a long, for a long time now. But also if you take Intel micro architectures, not the latest and greatest, but the like popular architectures like Sandy Bridge, they also have the limitation of one taken branch of one taken branch per two cycles. And then you have a tiny loop you are bottlenecked on the taken branch at the end of the loop. So in that case, unrolling by two is actually essential because you elim eliminate that bottleneck and can run at the width of, of the processor. So uh, it is an effect we, we were missing, I think, as a community, but we should pay attention to those things as well. And one of the things is important to keep in mind is there are 25 benchmarks in spec 2017, but depending on the customer, not all of them are as important. I tend to feel GCC and Perlbench are the two most important benchmarks in um, INT, and they may match a lot of the customer codes because most customer codes are not arrays of Fortran, arrays and sine and cosine and, and Floating point and all that kind of stuff. Floating point is a lot easier sometimes to optimize. GCC has one of the flattest profiles around, and so you don't have hot functions in it. Perl Bench is dominated by switch behavior, and again, a lot of code has switches in it, you know, and 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 so forth. Um, the others, X two sixty four and so forth, tend to be more specialized, and then you have the two memory things that just go through memory. And that depends a lot on your hardware caching and, and, and so forth. So the one thing X.264 does point out is a lot of things that were missing in the factorizer. And it's, sure. quite, mm -hmm. it's quite hard to, to figure out how much of these things apply to general code, but there are clearly shortcomings in the factorizer. Mm -hmm. And for historical stuff, in the back in the GCC Summit days, I think it was 2007 or 2008, I did write a paper called uh, Tricks of, the spec of a Spec Master that I wrote 
my thoughts at the time. You know, we probably already have these things, but you know, it may, may be useful just to go in and dig it out from a history point of view. I would like to six four part. Uh, I think in the last couple of years, uh, it's I mean, everyone who benchmarks must have seen it's been improving GCC quite a bit, and there's still more space to improve. Uh, one thing we found is that X64 ends up mapping quite well to many instructions, uh, to many quite special specialized instructions in the CMD instruction sets. So with a lot of the uh, vectorized pattern matcher has been extended quite a lot. It's now we recognize exotic things like some absolute differences and uh, vector average that also widen and truncate. And this is stuff that this is part of the ISIS that we just never generated before. But through X64, we can now actually generate them organically. Well, at least in terms of Spec 2006, I believe it was the other way around, where the hardware people looked at the, at Spec and said, what can we add? And SSC 3, I think, for example, which added the sum of absolute differences, specifically with that instruction was, presumed, I believe, was added just for Spec. Uh, back to uh, to the syncos and, and returning values in, in complex numbers, I just want to mention that we do terrible job in vectorizing complex Basically, we give up all the time, and that's something we probably should improve eventually because a lot of, uh, a lot of scientific code uh, uses complex numbers and could, could use vectorization of that. About the complex number, it, uh, GCC always lower the com almost immediately lower the complex number to the scalar. And maybe it's for the some reason, for the historical reason. And when I look at the x86 back, the ABI, uh, the 32-bit uh, ABI is not very, it's just, uh, essentially the same between the complex number and the scalar. On the other hand, the 64-bit ABI is, I should say, is kind of the uh, friendly more friendly to the complex numbers. But since we always lower the complex to scalar, we never see any benefit or we do not any take advantage of the uh, vector instructions for the complex numbers. So I actually have a patch that I submitted for the last GC that didn't make it in that I'm resubmitting now that will allow you to recognize multiplication, additions, and rotations of complex numbers and generate vector instructions for them. But they are, I'm kind of concerned by the ABI level because we, we are doing something very poorly at the, somewhere in the compiler. I, it, it's, it, it, it's I'm, I'm talking about the parameter passing and return. Yeah. Those part are terrible. We often force it into memory because we don't know how to handle it and then load it from memory, a scalar, and do something, and, and then for returning again, spill into memory and yeah. load it from there. We've seen some cases like that where you've got uh, homogeneous aggregates and you're passing that to functions. We see that the parameters come in the registers and then it all gets spilled onto the stack and then you read it again. Uh, that certainly is an area to be improved. Oh, okay. <laughs> that was just, a, that was just back to the structure peeling, I was wondering if you think that you're going to be able to leverage the earlier code, or is this a plan to start from scratch again? Uh, I think the earlier code needs to be updated to fit the new, oh. the new passes. So we are looking at what the, the we're looking at and trying to formulate a plan to see how we can get upstream. We might be able to reuse some, we might not, but I'm not sure at this point. All right. So I think as a concrete point of action, since there seems to be quite a lot of interest, I'm quite happy to create a place on the wiki and start collecting all the information that we know about there.
that makes it easiest for everyone to collaborate.